you don't lose when the things that you're working on don't give you any results. You don't lose then. When you lose is when you stop trying new things. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's video. I am so excited to have Sergio with us here today. Hey, Sergio, how are you doing? Hey, Raylan. Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Thank you so much for this invitation. Oh, it's so wonderful to have you here. I, I've been following your journey a little bit online with chronic fatigue syndrome. I know you have a chronic fatigue syndrome diagnosis, and although you're not all the way there in your recovery, you've come a really long way. So I'm just really excited to hear more about your journey, what that's looked like for you, and you know the things that have helped you along the way. For sure. So um, I don't know, like just I just wanted to thank you, Rita. I think. Um, a, this community that you're building is, is is amazing like it has had a huge impact on me and and I just want to use this time to 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 thank you for your book I feel a, any person that is in this journey should read your experience uh, I really connected with it. it 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 really changed many ways in which I was doing things uh, so yeah, thank you that is so nice to hear Sergio thank you I appreciate that so uh, like I was saying just before we started talking, now I feel like we're at a bit of a, I'm at a bit of a disadvantage because you know a lot more about me than I know about you. So it's time to rectify that. So uh, can you tell us, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself? Of course. So I'm Sergio. Um, I live in the Bay Area. I've been living here for the past uh, five years. I'm a PhD student and I'm originally from uh, Colombia. So as a, as a Colombian, uh, I like to dance salsa. It's like one of my passions. I have like uh, adopted a lot of like customs from Latin America by doing like a lot of traveling. I, I really like to drink like my mate. I have my mate with me all the time. Yeah, just um, that's me. I also wanted to 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 let you know that my personality is sometimes a little bit. I'm very like I have like very strong opinions. Uh, so take whatever I say with a grain of salt. Okay. <laughs> We've been warned. <laughs> All right, so of course we're gonna dive into what life for you with chronic fatigue syndrome has looked like and what recovery has looked like, but I'm always interested to know a little bit about what life was like for you before you became unwell. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, of course. Uh, so I was, and I'm still a PhD student. All of these uh, journeys started, I would say like four years ago. And as a PhD student, uh, I was focused on, on getting papers out, on doing good in my classes, and I, I am like a very, a, I'm very interested in sports. And, and at the moment, I, at the moment I was doing triathlon. Uh, I was training for, for an Ironman. And I would say that if I were to describe the Sergio of that time, I would say it's a person that was very focused on, on external success, like the success that you portray to other people. And at that moment in my life, health was really not a priority. So, so I would say that when the chronic fatigue happened, it was kind of like a message uh, from the universe telling me that I needed to re-examine my life. What, what exactly is an Ironman? What does that entail? It's a race, it's a triathlon race. You swim about the three kilometers. I'm going to say this in like metric units because... I've been living in the U.S. for like five years and I haven't get used, gotten used to like the way that they measure stuff. But uh, we so we do a three kilometer swim. Then we do a 180 kilometer bike ride. And, and then after that, it's a marathon. You run a marathon, which is like 26 miles, uh, 42 kilometers. And then you can say that you did an Ironman, which is like uh, the dream. That is insane. So... I think any of us who would see someone who's training to do something like that, and we would think they've got to be the healthiest person on the planet, like taking care of their health entirely. So when you say that you weren't so focused on health, what does that mean for you? That's a great question. So I feel like health is a holistic thing. Health is not only how you look on the outside. Uh, health has a lot to do with how you look in the inside. Health has a lot to do with your mindset. Health has a lot to do with eating the right food and not just the food that is going to make you look good, right? It has a lot to do with moderation in your life. People believe that health is just something that you show 
to others, but I feel that health has to be like within you. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I hear doctors and different, you know, documentaries and different things that I watch, they talk about this. It's possible to look really good on the outside and look really healthy or what we consider healthy, but you don't really know what's happening on the inside. And you don't know long-term, 20, 30, 40 years, what the prognosis is going to be for, you know, what you're doing to your organs and whatnot. Exactly, exactly. Um, there's, there's, for example, like these, these, these really good book about the blue zones, which are areas that, that are areas where like people on average live much longer. And uh, something that I learned is that people in areas where, where, where the average lifespan is like 90 years, something like that. Uh, in those areas, people are active throughout the day. We tend to think that, for example, uh, being healthy is like going for a run that is super intense for like one hour, but you don't actually see people that live longer doing this type of stuff. You see them like being active throughout the day, going on walks, uh, spending time with people, um, stuff like that. So, so for you, how did you first become unwell? What did that look like for you? Okay, so uh, I was training for an Ironman, and this happened uh, right after a very strong race that I had done here in California. It's called the Wildflower Triathlon, which is known as like one of the uh, most famous triathlons that happen around here. I had trained very strongly for that race. Uh, I think that was the trigger that that set the the symptoms of chronic fatigue. So it's like it's like the flu, and how many people describe it is like the flu that that doesn't uh, go away. It's like you you start you start uh, worrying like why is this flu that, like not going away, and. And like you go see a doctor, the doctor tells you it's it's, it's totally fine. Um, I remember that they thought that I had mononucleosis or something like that. And I was just like, for a couple of months, just like I relaxed about it. I thought like this is just going to go away. But you still keep on having these, these, these symptoms as if you had a flu. And you have things like a, what it's called post-exertional malaise. And and there were problems like trying to focus, trying to maintain clarity. It's like what many people call a brain fog. So I I went through, I would say, many, many, many doctors at the moment. And it took me some time to like finally like accept that I had to like work through this. I would say that during my worst times, it was a matter of like, a, I had to stay in my apartment. I couldn't like work or I could work maybe like one or two hours. I couldn't exercise at all. Like if I exercise, I would feel really bad the next couple of days. So yeah, that was it. So what was that like for you? Someone who was so physically fit, at least athletically speaking, to lose your ability to exercise? That's that's very interesting. That's kind of like um, a, a huge blow to your identity, right? Because you have built this identity out of a, I am a person that is really good at sports, right? And suddenly you're not able to, to do sports, right? So you start questioning yourself. You start thinking like, is this, am I the, am I the, uh, am I, am I failing as a person, right? Like, am I, uh, because my identity is being shattered, right? So should I just like start building a different identity? Like, 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 why do I do? You have like a, like a crisis, I would say. So yeah, I was just curious because you're at a whole other level athletically, what that would have been like for you to suddenly yeah, have that yeah, stripped yeah. away from you. Yeah, and you start like, um, you try to go back to the old patterns, right? Like uh, you feel good maybe one day and you're like, damn, this is the day. And then I would go for like, a, I don't know, like a 10K run, like super strong. And then I would regret it for like one week, you know? Yeah. Um, you, you, you try to go back to your old identity. Uh, you have to understand that that identity uh, might no longer exist, right? Like you have to understand that you have to create a new self. So when this all started happening, what did you do? Like how did you navigate the health system? What did that look like? So I think for all of the people that um, have gone on this journey, they, they, all, they all know that uh, navigating the health system uh, can be complicated. And I remember that for me, it was just a matter of a couple of, of weeks of doing some research until I discovered what chronic fatigue syndrome was. And I read about it and I started thinking like, damn, like I have these symptoms. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is what I have, right? Uh, so I started talking to my brother. My brother, is a, he's an infectious disease doctor. And, and I just asked for his advice. I told him like, hey, I have these symptoms of, of chronic fatigue. And 
And the first thing that that my uh, that my brother told me is was like he was he was very um, alarmed by me saying this, and he said like, "Don't say that to a doctor. Don't say it to a doctor that you have chronic fatigue, because you're just gonna be ignored. You're just gonna be completely ignored. People are gonna think that you just have some sort of thing that they don't want to deal with. So through your process." make sure that you look for very different alternatives to get like a proper diagnosis, but don't start your conversation with this. And I try to do that. And, and I try to basically explore different specialists. And I would say that I kind of like, with this opinion of my brother, I kind of like agree and disagree in some things. I, I feel like I disagree in the sense that in our community, eh, we have to be proud. We have to be proud that this is a real condition, right? And this is this is something that many people struggle with. But at the same time, eh, you have to be smart and you have to accept that there's a lot of judgments that doctors can make. So what I think are lessons that I that I learned through this process is first, like your chronic fatigue syndrome might be related to other health conditions, and you have to explore all of those health conditions. So for example, your CFS might be linked to neuroanatomical problems. And this is, for example, if you're interested in this, you can you can read some of the blog posts of, of Jennifer Brea, who is like a, an advocate of, of chronic fatigue. And, and she has found in her case a link between chronic fatigue and neuroanatomical problems. I have also seen that um, chronic fatigue can be linked with hormonal problems, such as problems in your pituitary gland, home, growth hormone deficiencies, uh, problems in your thyroid, uh, there is also a lot of uh, talk, especially, for example, at is, is research done at Stanford links chronic fatigue syndrome with Epstein-Barr viruses uh, or with Lyme disease. You should always consider like autoimmune diseases. The thing is that you should do a thorough study, I would say, of all of these possibilities and, and discard things. I also believe that you have to come to a doctor with very specific symptoms. Like you cannot, and this is something that my brother used to tell me, like fatigue is something that can be very unspecific. Like, of course, you feel you feel flu-like symptoms. Uh, you don't feel good, but it's hard for a doctor to like go into, into some specific diagnosis if, if all you're saying to the doctor is, hey, I just feel fatigued, right? Uh, yeah. Or I just feel, I just feel weak after, after exercising. So something that I learned was to listen to my body and try to understand what those very specific triggers were. So some of those triggers can be food related, like what type of foods like actually affect you or how does exercise affect you? You know, like what type of exercise? Like in my case, for example, I know that Foods that have like are are basically are based on like animal protein and and fats don't do very good for me. I learned that by just like like trying different things, right? Mm -hmm. And and you have to and listening to my body mostly. And I would say that's something that many of us can can struggle with is that we go through like many different doctors. And after going through like many different doctors, we, we feel disappointed. Like we feel like, like they don't really understand uh, or like they don't really want to try. And many people are like, I'm just going to solve this on my own, right? I'm just going to uh, experiment with many things mm -hmm. on my own. And I think that's fine. Like you should take matters in your own hands. But I still feel that having, a, if you can build a good team of doctors that care about you and that are always trying new things to help you out, then you should have that. Right? It's, it's not a matter of like, I'm just going to completely forget about the medical system and I'm just going to try alternative things. Make sure that you work hard on, on finding someone that, that, that cares about you. So it sounds like what you're saying is even if you are really quite or you're strongly suspecting that you have chronic fatigue syndrome and you've done the research, just don't go in with just that. You got to look at everything. You got to rule things out. And even just to be taken seriously. There's a certain things that you have to do is what I'm hearing you say when navigating the health system to ensure that you get taken seriously. And then if it's not going well, to not give up, you know, to keep looking and you know, try and build up that good support of doctors around you. Yes, exactly. Like unless unless you know that your doctor is like a person that has worked in the past with chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome just has like a bad rep. 
I think anyone who has this knows that that's unfortunate, but it's, it's also validating to hear it. So it's like, we're not crazy that we're imagining this when we see it in the doctors or, mm -hmm. yeah. So you talked a bit about mindset. So what has mindset looked like for you through all of this? I would say that there are, there are two main shifts that I had to do to, to the way that I, that I thought about this that made a real change and that allowed me to get closer and closer to recovery. The first one is for many, many years, like for two years, three years, I, I just tried to ignore it and I thought that it would go away. Right. And, um, and then finally I had to make the decision like, no, like health has to be a priority and it, it has to be priority number one in your life. So, and, and this is a lot, this related a lot with our, our, our previous discussion about the identity that we have. Like we have built an identity. We have, uh, I had built the identity of Sergio being uh, this person that uh, was an athlete, right? And that was a PhD student and was doing a very important research. So for me, that identity was my priority. I had to completely uh, break break out from that. I had to understand that right now my priority number one had to be health, and if health meant that I couldn't like exercise at the level that I had to exercise before, or I had to like work uh, at a different uh, level that I was working before, like I would do it because now my identity became the identity of a healthy person, and so that's what I was going to pursue. So that was the first shift in mindset. The second shift in mindset was that for many people, this can feel like CFS is taking over their lives, right? Like it can feel like this is all there is. And I am grateful that through all of these, I was not seriously bedridden, but I know that many people can be seriously bedridden. And I know that for them, as well as it was for me, chronic fatigue can become the center of your life. But I would say that Another important shift in my mindset was understanding that this is a challenge in your life, a very important challenge in your life, but this is not your life. And I shouldn't make this the central part of my life. And for me, I have tried to get the mindset that for some reason, life has thrown this obstacle in my way and, and I have to work on this. It's a challenge and, and it's a challenge that I'm going to work on every day. And I have to be proud of that. It's kind of like an adventure that I'm on and I'm going to learn so many things from that. And looking back of, on the last like five years, I have completely changed as a person and I've changed as a person thanks to this situation. This doesn't mean that we're going to accept that this is, this is a, the rest of our lives. It's quite the opposite. It's kind of like we're going to be focused on this as a challenge because we're going to get out of it. I love what you just said. And it's interesting because a lot of what you're saying is in line with uh, I did a vid video recently going over some of the research. I don't know if you know Dr. Jeffrey Rediger, but he does kind of like Dan Buettner with the Blue Zones who studies longevity. Dr. Rediger mm -hmm. studies um, what he calls spontaneous recovery, which is essentially people who recover from illness outside of the mainstream medical system. And he studies the themes amongst them around the world, the things that they changed, the things that they had in common. And mindset was huge. And many of the things that you just mentioned are things that he mentioned. It was acceptance of the illness. It was gratitude for the illness, which is a tough one. Uh, it was looking at it as an opportunity for growth and to better yourself and looking at it as like as a challenge. So all of those things it took me a long time to get there. How long did it take you to get to that point? Uh, I think it was just a, a process that probably probably happened the same moment that I realized that I had to do something about it, that I could just not let my life slip by, that I didn't want to say like, in 10 years, life is going to be the same. No, I, I, I decided like this has to change, right? And I think it was that moment that I started changing things and I started focusing on this instead of ignoring it. And that's when you realize the power that 
this can have to transform you. And I think that is how it happens, because once the awareness sets in, once you realize that a certain behavior is holding you back, it becomes a lot easier to let go of it, I find, and put it down and walk away from it. So you have made a lot of progress with your health, thankfully, which is wonderful to see. So what sorts of things have you been doing? What strategies have you been using? What, what's been successful for you? When you when you ask that, I'm reminded of this anecdote that I really like, which is what happened to the British cycling team in 2003. And this, this is going somewhere like I'm not, I'm not just going to randomly talk about cycling. I'm passionate. I'm very passionate about cycling. I'm following right now the, the, the Tour de France and there's a lot of Colombians that are close to like winning it. So last year a, a Colombian won it. So I, I'm pretty excited about it. But British cycling was not a big thing before 2003. Until this, uh, they hire a uh, Brailsford, who was a trainer, who completely tried to change the mindset of the cycling team. So what he came up with was what he, or like what right now is called the law of marginal gains. And if you want to learn a little bit more about this, I recommend the book Atomic Habits. It's it it, it talks about like this this anecdote. Um, but basically, what this tra- this 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 coach did was he tried for the team to make small daily improvements and very, very small daily improvements of the type of like 1%, uh, improvements that might seem like they will not make a big change. The thing is that when you make small improvements on the order of 1% every day, these improvements accumulate and they can bring real change in your life. So actually things that uh, the the coach did for the cycling team was things like how to make the racers wash their hands better so that they don't get infected with the flu, for example. What what, what is the best best, uh, massage gel that you can use? Or like what pillows and mattresses should the racers sleep in to get optimal sleep? So... I would say that this has been very important in, 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 in my recovery. I have tried to accumulate very small gains and I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Like they don't have to be the same uh, for me as for other people, but things that know that have created big change in the long run are like being in cycle with my circadian rhythm, right? Like you have a biological clock and you should try to follow that biological clock. So don't wake up at like, 10, 11 a.m., right? Like try to try to wake up when the sun goes out. Uh, that has worked for me. Uh, I'm not saying that that's going to work for everyone. Things that I do are, for example, I take a cold shower every morning. I try to uh, make myself press juice. I, I got like a press juice machine and, and I press my vegetables and I, I think that's very healthy. I try to follow a diet that is working for me that like gives me a lot of energy, which in my case is a vegetarian diet that is very high in carbs. But I know that for some people, keto diets or paleo diets can work very well. Like they don't do, they don't do that for me. It's like small habits, you know, it's like small habits that you, that you start building on and that they might not seem that impressive, but in the long term, they accumulate and they lead to change. And for me, it was a matter of like understanding that I had to de- do these, these small changes because first I could do them. And if I didn't do them, what was the alternative, right? The alternative was, be- was believing that miraculously I would like completely change, but there's like really no miraculous solution. Like you have to put on the work to, to, to actually improve. So it sounds like it hasn't been any one big thing or any couple of huge things like you started a new supplement or, you know, new prescription or something like that. It's just mm-hmm. been new daily habits, experimenting, making small tweaks, trying new things, listening to your body and just kind of adjusting as you go. Exactly. I would say there's there's big things, but like, for example, a big change came when I changed my nutrition and I focus on like high carb diets. But that's a bet right? Like maybe it could have had no effect whatsoever, right? It did, but I was willing to like make the small change in my life. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's important to like see that you, that experiment with these things and see if like they lead to some change or not. Okay. So at least in my experience, I know that making all of these changes isn't always easy. So what habits do you have or how do you keep this all on track? Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that question because Something that has been very important for me is to plan my day ahead. In my case, taking 10 minutes, 15 minutes in the morning 
where I just journal a little bit about the things that I'm going to do. And I'm very specific about them. I have an idea of what my purpose is. So my purpose is to be healthy. And I also have an idea of my purpose in my community and my purpose, my professional purpose. And I try to schedule the things that I'm going to do that day, uh, try to get me closer to, to, to that purpose. And that way I'm able to judge the day, not on like how I felt, but on whether I was on track with the things that I had planned. And I know that many people that struggle with chronic fatigue cannot predict how they're going to feel. Like this happens to me, for example, like the day might start amazing and then suddenly like all my energy levels like drop completely. And now like I have to take a nap. Right. So plan on those things as well. Like plan on the things that might happen, like plan. Okay. If what is going to be my plan B, like what if I start feeling not very good, like I'm going to take a nap, right? I'm going to take like a half an hour nap, a one hour nap, or I'm going to meditate, right? And along with planning your day in the morning comes also studying your day in the night. So this reminds me of a quote by the philosopher Socrates, uh, who said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And this is a very motivational quote for me. Every night I try to examine the things that I did during the day and how they contributed to my recovery. Just do that. Evaluate your day. See what you can work on. What did you do good? Uh, what are you grateful for? And what things you can improve? And I would say that among the habits that I try to plan for are how much I'm going to rest, how much I'm going to try to work, how am I going to make this day count and not just like this be another day in a collection of days. If I am going to exercise, like I, I really like the focus that you give in your videos, Raylan, about on, on exercise, I feel exercising is very important. And a, as you say, like exercising doesn't have to be like doing these workouts, right? Like exercising can be just like a minimal thing where you make your body be active, right? So I part of my habits is like exercising and thinking about like how much can I exercise and how much am I going to do? Yeah, virtually everything you just said, we seem very simpatico. I have a, a very similar you know, approach to life. I think it's uh, all about, I think, just having a conscious approach to how you live your life because it's too easy to just float through and kind of let it happen to you. So mm -hmm. starting your day with a plan and with a schedule, because for me, a schedule is very important because even just a list, that's a great start, but there's really no plan on how you're going to accomplish it. So if you can block out your day, how you plan to spend it and see realistically what you think you can accomplish. And yes. then the other thing you said that really resonated was have a plan always, but have flexibility with the plan. Like you need to be ready to abandon it for the day or change it or have a plan B. Because one thing that I struggled with is I very few things in life make me happier than having a plan and sticking to it to the letter. I just feel productive and like I crushed my day, you know, it's just awesome. So I had to really come to peace with the fact, like with my exercise, I might decide, I make a plan for the week. I'm going to exercise four days for five minutes each time, mm -hmm. but then something happens and I can't. So I think it's important to have that plan, but to not judge yourself and not beat yourself up and be able to, you know, adjust exactly like you said, adjust accordingly. Yes, yes, yes. I, I actually recommend, um, I just started doing some, a journaling on this thing called the high performance planner it's um uh, it's this thing that i have right here i just got it it's by a, a development coach called brendan bircher it's worked for me like i've been using it for a couple of weeks maybe it can work for other people so all these things you try and all the the different things you experiment uh, how do you find them okay so i am very active in um in trying to find things that might work. And I jump into, I, I, I do my research and I just find some gems from time to time. Like for example, finding your videos, like that was like amazing. Uh, but basically it's a, it, it's a little bit, not, not too much about the method, but about the philosophy. I would say my philosophy is that you should keep on experimenting all the time. And that actually you don't lose when the things that you're working on don't give you any results. You don't lose then. When you lose is when you stop trying new things. Uh, that's the moment that you lose. So what I do is I just go on Google and I try to uh, find sometimes 
videos of people. I find um, research papers and I try to read them and try to like make sure that I, that I understand something. There is also a resources such as clinics that specialize in chronic fatigue. So I try to like uh, find those clinics and talk to doctors and sometimes I schedule appointments with them and then I, I try to gauge like uh, whether this is something that is going to be good for me or not. It's mostly a matter of like always having something on hand that is going to give me something new to try. Reading books about chronic fatigue uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be about CFS. It can be about health in general, right? Like that that can that can be very useful. So for example, I don't know this book that I was telling you about the blue zones, right? Like you can use some of these strategies that they use in the blue zones to to have long uh, longevity. Uh, you can use them in your life, right? And make your your health better. It doesn't have to be specific resources towards a uh, chronic fatigue. I love that. And when you said, I might not get the words exactly, but you don't lose when you try something and fail, you lose when you stop trying. I actually got goosebumps because it is very heartbreaking to see people that have just lost hope and stop trying because it does mm-hmm. then now seem like a, a pretty hopeless situation. Yeah. Thank you for explaining all of that. Very well said. Yes. I would, I would also add that this is kind of like a process. It's kind of like you do your research you come up with like new ideas, you try them. And something that I feel is very important is dropping things that don't work. Because I have seen a lot of people, like for example, supplementation, like there is so many supplements out there Mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of important to know whether they're working for you or not. So just try something, try it for enough time because like the timing of these things can be long, can be like weeks or can be months. But if you have tried something for weeks or months and you see it has no effect, try to drop it and try to look for something else. Don't like be this person that ends up having 100 supplements and like a bag full of like supplements uh, that it's not clear whether they work for you or not. I used to be that girl. And then if something is working, you have no idea what it is because there's so many things in there. (laughs) One of my favorite expressions is if you're riding a horse and it dies, get off. And I feel like that expression, someone came up with it for me because I like just sticking with something for the sake of sticking with it because I take pride in like, I'm following through, I had a plan or I said I was going to do something for six months and it's clearly not working, but I said I'd stick with it for six months. So I do just for the sake of yes. sticking with it. Yeah. And, and you're sacrificing your time, you know, like you are a, you're sacrificing mental space when you have so many things in your life and you're not allowing new things in. It's something I kind of have learned from working in the tech industry is that you need to learn to fail fast. Like it's a very iterative process. Like you constantly need to be like taking in new information, you know, accepting your failures quickly, learning from them, moving on, taking out the judgment, you know, taking the stigma away from failure, taking my pride out of it. Even though I said I was going to do it for six months, it's okay to quit after three weeks if it's clearly not working. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's, it's crazy. Like I have, uh, in the in the journal that I write down my day, I have exactly that particular quote, like fail fast. It's so important okay. to fail fast. So you've mentioned in some of our earlier chats a bit about spirituality. How, how has that played into your whole recovery process? So I feel like spirituality helps you build that resilience that you need to be able to experiment and not get discouraged. Uh, it gives you that resilience to know that you're giving everything that you have. And if things don't work, it's fine because you're going to keep on trying. And it takes a very specific mindset to be able to be like that and not get affected by failure easily. So something that actually changed my life was doing a Vipassana meditation. So Vipassana meditation is a type of, of meditation that... They say it's the, it's the type of meditation that the Buddha did. Vipassana head meditation has become very popular because there's a lot of Vipassana centers. Uh, and I'm very grateful for them because I did, a, I did a meditation retreat of 10 days in one of these, medita- in one of these Vipassana centers. I've, I really like about them that they're like doing this for the sake of helping people reach more spiritual lives they're not doing these because of the sake of like getting any type of profit or anything and and you can you can see that all of these courses are completely free like you go there and like 
Uh, they teach meditation for 10 days. They give you food. They give you a place to stay. They don't charge you anything for it. You can, of course, oh, donate. Wow. You can, of course, donate uh, whatever you whatever you feel like donating uh, for future uh, courses. Uh, this is something that not only changed me in my path towards recovery, it also changed me as a person and in the relationships that I have with other people. It fills you up with empathy and it fills you up with resilience. I really recommend it. There's there's like some funny stories that I have about that 10-day retreat that I went on. Like it's crazy, but like after those 10 days of meditating, you get out of there and you drink a cup of coffee and that cup of coffee feels like the best coffee that you've had in your life. And you feel everything. You feel the flavor. You feel the sensation in your mouth. It's like it's like amazing. It's like short-term benefits of meditating. But there's also long-term be- benefits of meditating. And it's that it helps you in all of these uh, processes. So something that is very important for me is my meditation routine. I try to meditate at least a little bit every day. And it has really helped me. Sounds like there could be really a ton of benefits that come from it. And, you know, in terms of specific recovery strategies, I don't know about you, but I've been hearing more and more about the importance of, you know, calming the stress response in our body and, you know, Mm -hmm. supporting the parasympathetic nervous system and just putting your body in a healing state. So I don't think we always think of things like meditation as in terms of a healing strategy, but I think it very much is. It sounds like it has been for you. You mentioned community a little bit earlier on. So what does that look like for you? I do have a couple of strategies that I follow regarding community. And it's that, as I mentioned, like I try to take responsibility for this and 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 I try not to blame other people or not to make other people responsible for this path that I'm, that I'm uh, taking. And most importantly, I try to build community by finding people that are really good with health. So people that I feel live very healthy lives and I try to uh, follow their advice and I try to uh, learn more about the things that they do. If you want to learn basketball, uh, you try to look for uh, Michael Jordan, right? If you try to learn about like how to be a good soccer player, you admire things like uh, Lionel Messi, right? So if you're trying to recover from chronic fatigue, Please don't go into into spaces that are filled with negativity and are filled with a a mentality of this is a lost cause. Okay, so if you really want to recover, try to find spaces such as you your YouTube channel is like a great space for that. Like a try to find people that that believe in recovery, people that are every day fighting towards it. Instead of like getting yourself into a conversations with people that are just filled of negativity. I agree a thousand percent with all of that. And we hear so much about this in terms of everything, not just recovery. What do they say? You're a, essentially like a, a sum of the, the five people you spend the most time with. Or, you mm-hmm. know, one of my goals in life is to always surround myself with people who are better than me, at least in some way, because you're always wanting to elevate yourself and get better and learn and grow. And if you are surrounding yourself with people who are struggling, it's easier to go down. It's an easier direction to go down. So you're always going to get pulled down. So I, I love what you said, because when we surround ourselves with people who are excelling in whatever it is we're trying to get better at, um, it, it's, it's just going to bring us up. So yeah, yes. that's really important. And this is not easy, you know, like it's not easy because it's not like, oh, I have so many people around me that I can just choose like the five yeah. best people and, and just like, hey, can I, can I, can you like mentor me somehow? This takes a lot of effort, you know, it takes a lot of effort to like find these people. It takes a lot of effort to like follow their advice, but this is something that you should look for uh, proactively. And uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily people that you have like a direct relationship with. It can be people that you just admire and that you follow and that you try to be like right so for example i don't know like i was i was just discussing a uh, this morning with a friend about how much i love the the work of jay shetty jay shetty is a mm-hmm. is a personality uh, in in youtube he's a storyteller and i really like like the stories that he tells 
I aspire to be like him in, 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 in many ways, right? So try to find people that you aspire to be like. Like I, I, I also aspire to be like you, Raylan. Like I, 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 I read your book and, and, I, and I felt like so inspired and I try to imagine myself like, hey, be like this person, you know? Uh, make your decisions thinking like I want to be like him or like her. Thank you for that, by the way. Very nice of you to say. And also, yes, you're right. Good point. It doesn't have to be physical people. And so much of our world, especially now in the time of COVID, is online communities. So just being very careful about who that online community is. And I follow Jay Shetty as well. I find him to be very inspirational. So just having strict boundaries with the kind of content that you're taking in. And and, and yeah, you can get that inspiration from, from, from people from anywhere. So... You've shared a lot today. Thank you for all of this. I, I think a lot of people will appreciate hearing this. Um, just as we wrap this up, is there any other advice that you would like to give to people who are currently facing chronic fatigue syndrome? Yes. So I think it's very important. Like I already mentioned this, but chronic fatigue is not or doesn't have to be the center of your life. Try to live your life to the fullest. And of course, like living your life to the fullest depends on what situation you are in at that particular point in time, right? But if you're not able to like uh, get out of your house for for some for because because it takes too much effort, like try to do things in in your house that make you feel excited, right? Like uh, try to play an instrument. Like I, for example, have learned to play the ukulele, uh, and uh, and it's filled me with with excitement and. Once I started like gaining, gaining like a lot of energy from the work that I had been doing, like I started to do some traveling and traveling opens your mind. I, I really connected with you because of because of that as well. Like I felt like yeah. I also have had like similar experiences when I was traveling like in Southeast Asia as, as, as you did. And it doesn't matter the situation that you're in. You can always find ways to make your life happier and to make each day count. Something that I really recommend as well is to think about your life as a project and think about the things that you want to accomplish. There is a, this book that I recommend to all of my friends. It's called uh, Designing Your Life. It's by Bill Nornet and, and Dave Evans. It's basically a book that uses design thinking to be able to help you design the life that you want for yourself, regardless of where you are in this moment. So the book like basically says like, you are here in this moment, forget about your past. Let's plan a future for yourself and let's try to live your life with purpose. Well, thank you so much, Sergio, for your time today. I really cannot thank you enough. I, I just think it's so valuable to get this information out and get the more stories out that we can so people can know that they are not alone. Maybe something they see will inspire them or motivate them or just be comforting in some way. And I just really appreciate your time today. So thank you. Thank you very much. No, thank you for the invitation. Like, it's amazing to, it, it, I feel very grateful to like have been invited by you, like, especially since yeah, I admire you in, in, in so many ways. So, so yeah, thank you. And thank you to everyone who is watching. We uh, so much value everything that you, you know, all the contributions and the comments and the discussions that come out of this. And if you have any questions for Sergio or for myself, always, you can just leave them in the comments here. And I'm sure Sergio would be happy to answer them. And if you think someone might enjoy this video, please share it. You can share it in any of your favorite social spaces. So that is all for today. Thank you again, Sergio. Thank you, everyone watching. Uh, and take care.